Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the study that we're doing, Foundations, on uh, five different elemental biblical topics. And the topics that we're talking about here, who is God? What does it mean to be saved? What, what, is, what happens when you die? Death. What is God looking for for worship? How does a judgment process work? Morality, good and evil. How do all these things play together? So whether you're an atheist, whether you're a, a Christian your whole life, whether you're an agnostic, whether you're someone who just doesn't want anything to do with God, whoever you are, I know that these topics, they, they really touch at our human experience. So I hope that they'll be relevant to you because of that. And, and I want you to understand coming into this that I was not really born and raised with the things that we're talking about today. I had a transition in my life where I was studying the Bible and I grew up in a Christian home, but in looking at some of these things, I realized that my perspective, my presuppositions, which means something that you presuppose to be true, even before you take a look at the material, it's already there. I realized that for me, a lot of those things that I grew up believing in actuality, they violated Scripture, and they placed the Bible in a state of internal conflict, where it conflicted with itself. And we know from 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be equipped for every good work. So there can't be contradiction in the Bible. I'm coming at this from a, from a Christian perspective, so believing that the Bible is a source of authority. And whatever you believe about that, just understand that it is okay to take your presuppositions, your bias, your ideas about things, place them on the table over here just for a moment so that you give the Bible an opportunity to speak for itself free from the bondage and the baggage of what you carry with you. There's things I realized about what I believe that were taken from all kinds of sources, from, from movies or from quotes or from songs, like um, everybody's seen the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, right? And, and we hear, well, every time a bell rings, another angel gets his wings. And so people believe this idea that we turn into an angel maybe when we die from a movie, and so it's not a malicious thing, but sometimes we just carry with us baggage that we don't even know where it's from. So I want you to remember that as we go into this study on what happens when you die. Now this series is going to be uh, five different topics with two uh, kind of segments on each of those topics. Maybe you've gotten to the series because you've seen one of the two minute videos that we've done online, kind of an attention grabber, kind of uh, a conversation starter, if you will. Then maybe you've watched uh, one of the 20 to 30 minute videos that we've done, which is kind of a more comprehensive, but, but still very concise presentation of these points. So what I want for this study to be is an opportunity for us to really dig in to this material to get into the meat of it, to take a look at and analyzing these verses. What does the Bible say and, and, and why does it say it? All right? So what happens when you die? Well, let's start at the beginning, a very good place to start. And turn with me here if you would like to, or you can read it on the screen. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And we need to look at getting into this. We need to know what are we made up of? Because if we die and we want to know what happens when we die... This is a great place to start, and I hope that this will be a, a resource for you as well to maybe be able to teach or to share with other people as you study this. Begin to work through your own thought process, if you've heard some of this before, so that you are able to uh, reiterate this to someone else who asks. The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, so we see that he forms a man from the dust and breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So what's happening here is we have three different parts. This is really, really important to establish when we're studying this topic. We need to know that we're comprised of three different parts. We have God forming man from the dust, from the elements, a physical formation of man's body. And, so a second element, God breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. You'll read this word more and we'll talk about it. It's the word spirit in the Old Testament. His, he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, a life force, an energy that is within all living things. And the combination of these two things brings something into existence. Man became a living being or a living soul. 
And you'll read the word soul in the Old Testament. Now that's different from the breath. And we're going to talk specifically about this. But in case you think that this is kind of an Old Testament concept, look here what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at an illustration. Illustrations are helpful, right? They give us a visual I'm all about the visual. So think of a light bulb. A light bulb is comprised, you really have three different pieces. You have the bulb itself, which is like the body, the physical elements, the the glass, the the filament inside, the, um, the screws for it to screw into a socket, the bulb. Then you have the electricity coming into it, which is like the breath of God. And the combination of those two things generates or creates light which is like the human soul, a light that is specific to that light bulb and what it's made of. Does that make sense? That's a really good visual for us to think of as we process this. So I want to talk about these two different words, soul and spirit, spirit and soul. This is really important for us to get. Um, This is where a lot of confusion comes in for a lot of people. The word in Hebrew, ruach, is used 378 times in the Old Testament. And 357 of those times... It's used to specifically mean spirit, wind, or breath, like the breath of life. Take, for example, here in Job chapter 27, where Job says, as long as I have life within me, and he clarifies, what is that life within me? That is the breath of God in my nostrils. The life within me is the breath of God. So that is ruach, God's breath, the breath of life. It animates all living things, a life force, an electricity, an energy. Now, that's not to be confused with the Hebrew word nephesh, which is used 753 times in the Old Testament. And 592 of those times, it's used to specifically mean soul or life. Now, what this is, it's, it, it's like the seat of individuality. It's what makes you, you. And it's what makes me, me, as separate from you. My, my life, my consciousness, my awareness, my existence. Okay, that's nephesh. Very different from Ruach, the breath of life. Let's look at an example of this. Deuteronomy chapter 11. If you faithfully obey the commands I'm giving you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, all of who you are, all of your being, to love God and to serve him with with everything that you are, all of your capacity. So we see that a light bulb without the electricity or breath, there is no soul generated. There's no light coming from it. A light bulb with the electricity, with the breath, generates light. Now, here's the real question. If something happens to that light bulb and it gets crushed or the electricity is shut off from it, what happens to the light? And that's the real question that we're asking. What happens when you die? People don't want to know what happens to your body. They want to know what happens to me. Where do I go? What, what happens when I die? So to answer that, I want to start here at Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, okay? Revelation 2, 7, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, this really starts to touch at the fundamental problem within the thinking and the presuppositions and the traditions of most Christians. Why is the tree of life in the paradise of God? So that we can eat from it. Why do we need to be given the right to eat from the tree of life in God's presence forever? Because you and I do not possess intrinsic immortality meaning immortality with and of ourselves. It is such an arrogant idea to think that just because you and I exist, we have the right to live forever. Just because we were created at one point, now we just get to have eternal life forever, just because since now we're here and, and we live forever. That doctrine was, was not a part of Scripture ever. It came from the Greek philosophers. You remember like Greek mythology and everything that came with that in the early church was fighting against those things. Peter, Paul, they were teaching, they were fighting against that doctrine. It's a very uh, a corrupt doctrine that was kind of uh, coming in and, and uh, infesting the early church. 
and it's dangerous. And that's kind of where this immortality of the soul comes from. We're going to talk a lot more about that next week, but I just wanted to make sure that, that we touch on that here in the beginning. So what we see is that the body plus the breath of life equals a living soul. A soul is created from the sum of these two things, and without those two things, it, it's not in existence. So what happens when you die? Let's look at what happens to these three pieces. All right? Let's start with the body. And I'm going to throw a lot of scripture at you. I want this to be a presentation, not from me and my ideas, but from the Bible. And remember, let's give it a clear opportunity to speak, a chance to speak for itself. The Bible says in Genesis, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. In Job chapter 10, verse 8, your hands shaped me and made me. Will you now turn and destroy me? Remember that you molded me like clay. Will you now turn me to dust again? Where then is my hope? Who can see any hope from me? Will it go down to the gates of death? Will we descend together into the dust? That's from Job chapter 17. Let's look at Ecclesiastes 3.20. All go to the same place. All come from dust and to dust all return. Let's jump to the Psalms, chapter 22. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Psalm 103, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. And one more, James 2, 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so Faith without deeds is dead. So we see pretty clearly, and I think probably most people would agree because it's scientifically observable what happens to the human body after we die, that the body returns to the elements. It decays. It degenerates. It, it goes back to dust. I like this passage here because it, it kind of is a good transition for us. The body is without the spirit now remember, spirit, the wind, the breath of God is dead. So if the body dies, it returns to dust, what happens to the spirit? Well, let's look at that next. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. The dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit, the breath of life, returns to God who gave it. Now you can see where people start to get a little sideways on this because they don't understand that the spirit is different than the soul. In English, as translators were translating, they, there's no real difference. There's, they're kind of synonyms, spirit and soul. You, you use these interchangeably. But in the original language, the words are very different and have very different meanings. So just keep that in mind as we, as we continue reading here. The spirit, the breath of life, returns to God who gave it. I like this one, Job chapter 34, verse 14. If it were his intention and he withdrew his spirit and breath, all humanity would perish together and mankind would return to the dust. So God's spirit, the breath of life, is what animates us and gives us life. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. That's Psalm 104. And let's look at one more. Luke chapter 23. This is when Jesus is on the cross. A great example for us. Having cried with a loud voice, Jesus said, Father, to thy hands I commit my spirit. And I'm using Young's literal translation here because it, it gives a very precise translation of each word uh, rather than just the whole concept. So when we read word by word, we get a good idea of what the original language was saying. Father, to thy hands I commit my spirit, my breath. And these things having said, he breathed forth the spirit. He offered to God the breath of life, which comes from God. And Jesus died. So we see the body returns to dust. The spirit returns to God who gave it. The breath of life goes back to God. The question is, what happens to the soul? What happens to the soul? What happens when you die? And we're going to spend some time here on this. You sweep people away in the sleep of death. Now the Bible talks about the soul sleeping. We call it soul sleep. When the body dies, the breath returns to God. The soul goes into a state of sleep. Now that's how the Bible refers to it. Now let's just take this for a minute and assume that the soul is, is sleeping means that 
somehow it's going to heaven. It doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? Because if you're in a state of sleep, it seems like heaven would be the greatest joy and the greatest ecstasy and the most, you know, it's the epitome of being alive. But yet the Bible calls it sleep. That would be very odd. But let's look at at what the Bible also says about this in Acts chapter 2. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently, Peter says here, that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. For David did not ascend to heaven. Now remember, Peter's talking here after Jesus has died and risen again. So some people say, oh, well, you know, in the Old Testament, people were sleeping. But once Jesus died and he rose, now people rise again. But... Peter says David did not ascend to heaven. This is after Jesus has already risen. So where where is David? Well, let's read what he wrote about death himself. It is not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down to the place of silence. Psalm 115, verse 17, those who go down to the place of silence. Now we have to pause here for a moment because there's a bit of a chasm, a little gap in our understanding when we read this versus when the Jews read it. Because we've been kind of indoctrinated by the modern Christian church's teaching, which is really quite Greek, no pun intended, in its presentation of of death and of the soul. What the Jews understood about the place of silence, you'll read in your Bible maybe the word Sheol or Hades. People think Hades means hell. Really, it just means the grave. And that's what Sheol means as well, the Hebrew word Sheol. It was the name of of the place of the dead, the state of the dead. The place of silence. So I want to touch on this for a minute and jump back to some ancient writings that that I pulled for us uh, from the Jewish Encyclopedia of 1906, which takes a bunch of ancient Jewish texts and kind of compiles them in in order to present the the beliefs of ancient Judaism. Now let's read this for a minute and I'm going to walk us through it. As long as the soul, so we're talking about the soul here, was conceived to be merely a breath, inseparably identified with the lifeblood, no real substance could be ascribed to it. Here's what I want to get to. As soon as the spirit or breath of God, which was believed to keep the body and soul together, is taken away, the soul goes down to Sheol or Hades to lead a shadowy existence without life or consciousness. As soon as the spirit or the breath of God is taken away, The soul goes down to Sheol or Hades to lead a shadowy existence without life and consciousness. The Jews understood that the place of silence, the place of the grave, is a state of no life, no animation, no awareness, no consciousness. Simply a a waiting place. And let's continue on here uh, with the next piece of this. The belief in the continuous life of the soul the immortality of the soul, underlies primitive ancestor worship and the rites of necromancy, which is like communicating with the dead, was discouraged and suppressed by both the prophet and the lawgiver as antagonistic to the belief in Yahweh, the God of life. So remember, this is ancient Jewish texts that we're reading here. They say that the continuous life of the soul, the belief that the soul is immortal and it just goes on and on forever, which is what I grew up believing, right? As soon as you die, the very next moment, you're standing before God's judgment seat. He tells you left or right, heaven or hell, and there you go to live forever, either in heaven or in hell. There's no, your body dies, but your soul just continues living on in one of two places. Now, maybe a really horrible place or a really great place, but eternal life nonetheless. That goes against what the Jews believed about the Hebrew scripture and what they still believe even to this day. The continuous life of the soul underlies these pagan practices. It is the the reason, the fuel behind idolatry Worship of other gods, of ancestors, and the rites. It's the, it's the fuel behind the communication with the dead, which you can read in, in Samuel, how Saul, right, when he wanted to talk to the prophet Samuel, he goes to a witch to try to communicate with Samuel because he had died. This was discouraged and suppressed by the prophets and the lawgiver as antagonistic to or against or standing in opposition to the belief in God himself. Why? Because the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6.16 that God alone is immortal. 
And we're going to get to that more, but that God alone is immortal. So by, by artificially or supposedly granting us immortality, you stand against God and his word. And it, it paves the way for all kinds of wicked practices. So in case you want to read more about that, um, I'm just going to throw these resources up there. Uh, you can look back if you're watching the video. Uh, you can screenshot that or whatever you want to do. Some of them date back into the early uh, third century, stuff like that. But maybe you say, well, Chris, I, uh, I'm like more of a Bible-believing Christian. I don't care about all that, all those old ancient resources and things like that. I'm more interested in what the Bible has to say. Well, let's see if we can dig a little bit and find an example of what the Jews believed from the Bible. Let's look at the story of Lazarus in John chapter 11. After he had said this, Jesus speaking here, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. Now again, I just have to say it would be really odd if Lazarus is in heaven and Jesus says that he's asleep and he's going to wake him up back on earth from being in heaven. It would just be a little odd. Next verse, his disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So it clarifies here for us, and Jesus tells them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Don't you like when Jesus does that? Because it's like sometimes things are so confusing. Jesus tells them plainly, Lazarus is dead. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Great faith that Martha shows here. For the story of Mary and Martha, where we kind of put her down sometimes, Martha has great faith. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now, again, it would be weird for Jesus to say that he will rise again if he was already risen and in heaven. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So Martha really clearly exhibits what is the common Jewish belief here, that, that Lazarus is dead. He's in the place of silence. He's in Sheol, Hades, the grave. It's just, it's just you call it a place, but really it's just a state of non-existence, of lifelessness, of no conscience. You're not aware of what's going on. The dead know nothing. But in the resurrection at the last day when Jesus returns and makes all things new, I know he will rise again. That was the Jewish belief. It's not the current Christian belief, but it was the Jewish belief at this time. Let's look at Psalm 146. We're going to look at a few more scriptures here about the soul. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life and sing praises to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes and human beings who cannot save. For when their spirit breath departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Ecclesiastes 9.5, I just referenced this verse. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And I want to get here in Daniel three verses as we move on. We got to get the context of this, right? Context means with the text. And as we go through this study, uh, this series on foundations, it's important for us to understand with the text. It means that you got to be really careful plucking verses out of, of their surrounding body of the chapters around them, right? The Bible wasn't written with chapters and verses. It was these messages or letters or, or historical recordings. And so we need to make sure that if something kind of pops up, that seems to be a contradiction from another place in Scripture. It's a little red flag for us that should make us aware that we need to take a look first at the context in which it was written. And in the book of Daniel here, the time, at that time, there, there is an angel that has come to Daniel with a prophetic vision about the end times and the return of Jesus at the end. And the time leading up to that was the tribulation, which Daniel 12 says is 1,335 days long. We're going to get into a prophetic study later on after this one. But for now, just know that that is the context of here, and you can read it yourself. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, 
some to everlasting life, the first resurrection, and others to shame and everlasting contempt, the second resurrection. Next session, we're going to talk specifically about the resurrections. But what I want us to see here is that at the time of Christ's return, there are multitudes sleeping in the dust of the earth that are going to awake to a state of awareness and consciousness. And later in verse 13, boy, this is awesome. As, as for you, go your way till the end, the end of your life, Daniel. You will rest, sleep in death, and at the end of the days, he just talked about the 1,335 days, which at the end of those days, Jesus is returning, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. How cool is that, that, that God gives Daniel the assurance that he is in the faith, that he will be raised at the last day. That is awesome. But what I want us to see here is that he's going to receive at the last day his allotted inheritance. What is the inheritance that Daniel is waiting to receive? Yeah, eternal life. Eternal life. It's the thing that all of us long for. We are on the clock all the time, and this is where it becomes so relevant to us. Every moment is ticking by. And if Jesus doesn't come back to take us home before we die, each and every one of us are going to a grave. Probably everyone in this room has been touched by death. Someone that we love. A friend, a grandparent, a parent. Maybe something in your life right now is forcing you to face the reality of your own mortality something that we deal with and what we long for is eternal life where we're not on that clock anymore. In this world, all we know is time. As soon as something comes into existence or a person is born or something is made or created, it, it, the clock begins ticking and it's moving towards an expiration date. The inheritance that Jesus promises us and the beauty and the joy of what happens when you die is that at the last day, those who are in faith, those who are in the faith, who have chosen to, to do what they know is right, are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. They will rise to receive their allotted inheritance of eternal life. Praise the Lord. Let's look at a couple more here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So we know Jesus was at least the first one. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Now this is Paul talking well after the time of Jesus' resurrection and his ascension to heaven. And he's still using the future tense. That all those who have died in Christ will be made alive at the last day. Not currently alive in heaven, just coming back to get their bodies for no apparent reason. But will be made alive in the future tense. But each in turn. So when are they going to be raised up? Christ as the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. When he comes. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. Do you see Paul pleading with the people and fighting against these pagan philosophies that are like trying to get, weave their way into the church? We don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you don't grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. What he's saying here is that Jesus is coming back to the earth to get his people. And God is going to bring them with Jesus back to heaven. Don't get this twisted around. Try to make it say something that it doesn't say. At that day, Jesus is coming back to retrieve his people from this sinful, wicked planet and take us back home forever to have eternal life. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever." Boy, how awesome is that? Does this not just epitomize the hope that we have? At the last day, it's not some weird thing of a bunch of people who were already in heaven that the Bible refers to them as being asleep and dead and knowing nothing, coming back to get their bodies, which they don't need to be in heaven. 
This is a beautiful illustration of, of those who are asleep in death, awaiting the resurrection. Jesus comes back, and just like Lazarus, he calls his name. Lazarus, come out of that tomb. Lazarus stands up and walks out and glorifies the Lord for his mighty power and everyone around. And it was actually that event that caused the Jewish leaders to want to kill Jesus, by the way. So what's happening at the end is Jesus is coming back and he's raising up his people. And as those who are still alive are standing on the earth, they're going to be able to witness the dead being raised and the perishable being, being raised imperishable, meaning those, those physical, nasty, decaying bodies raised with a new, beautiful, glorious form taken up into the sky. And then we get to be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air and be with him forever. Awesome. Now, there's one more I want to get to here, um, and it's one that's kind of, a, it's kind of a story behind it, because it's, it's in Hebrews chapters 11 and 12. And Hebrews chapter 11 is what's called the Hall of Faith. And it's where the Bible lists all these people who, who had faith, who, who uh, believed God, and it was credited to them as righteousness. Noah, Abraham, Samson, David, all of these different great heroes of Bible stories that we know and love. Well, then in Hebrews chapter 12, it starts out and it says, Since we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us run the race with endurance. And so in my kind of, uh, my kind of evolution and my understanding and trying to let go of my presuppositions and understand what the Bible's saying for itself, I spoke with a lot of mentors, theologians, pastors, people, and one in, spe- in particular uh, was always wanting to use this verse to explain to me you know, why the soul is immortal. And, and he says, well, look, here you have this cloud of witnesses. It's like an amphitheater, right? And there's all of these people in heaven, and they're, they're looking down. They're looking down at us, and they're cheering us on and telling us that you can do it. You can run the life of faith. And, and, and that's a beautiful picture of, of grandma, grandpa, you know, mom, dad, your dog, Fido. I don't know who's up there, but all of these different people cheering you on. You see, the soul is immortal. And I said, yeah, but if you back up, context, right? If you back up two verses, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what was promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. And I said, now, wait a second. So who is this cloud of witnesses? And all of a sudden, I was inspired by this verse, instead of feeling like challenged and defensive, the beauty when we, when we are willing to let go of our paradigms and align our beliefs to what God's word says, instead of aligning, trying to twist God's word to align what we believe, the beauty is, is freedom. It's freedom. No longer do you have to defend something, but God's word can speak to you clearly. You know, a, a lawyer and a, and a judge once said, when, an, when a man who is honestly mistaken is confronted with the truth, he either ceases being mistaken or he ceases being honest. When we're confronted with something that we realize is true, we have one of two choices. We can either realize that we're mistaken and alter what we believe to fit what we know is right, or we can try to justify and rationalize and twist what we know is right to fit what we believe. Here in this chapter, I realized, wow, the cloud of witnesses is not, is not this group of people somehow alive in heaven witnessing to God, telling him about the great life that we're living. A witness testifies, right? You have to ask, what does a witness do? In a court trial, a witness is called in to testify about something, to bear a testimony. And so this isn't a group of people saying, well, God, you know, look at, look at my boy down there. <laughs> Chip off the old block. He's really serving you and doing Bible studies and leading worship and doing all this. I hope you're seeing this, God, because he's really serving you. You see what I'm saying? Witnessing about me, testifying to God, that doesn't make sense. God already has two witnesses. He has the law, which bears testimony either for us or against us, whether we are sinful or righteous. And he has the Holy Spirit speaking to us of whether we have faith, like Hebrews chapter 11 talks about. Their faith was counted to them as righteousness. So God has two witnesses. He doesn't need a bunch of mortal human beings to be explaining to him why people should go to heaven or hell. And all of a sudden, the beauty comes in. This isn't a group of people testifying to God about us. They're testifying to us about God. And you realize, wow, Noah 
was this man who lived such a long time ago and, and, and for 120 years he preaches about God's judgment that's coming, but God's mercy and grace. If we just build this boat and get on it, God will spare us from the wrath that is coming. He preaches it. He likely gives everything that he has, every dollar that he has to fund this ginormous boat when it had never rained before. And for 120 years, he's met with persecution and objection and mockery. And then the day came where the floods came, the rains came. And because of Noah's faith, he was saved, he and his family. And you look at that and you say, wow, God's mercy and grace is enough. God's goodness is enough. His plan is right and true. I can have faith like that. I can follow him if Noah could do that. You look at someone like Abraham who's called to leave everything he knows, leave his family, leave his friends, leave the place that he knows, and to go to a land that God hadn't even told him where he's going. So he packs up everything he has and he just goes. Later on, God gives him a son in his old age, his only son from him and his wife, and God calls him to sacrifice that child on the altar. And instead of saying, God, what? What are, you, what are you talking about? I can't, you gave me this. Abraham has faith and he goes to do what God told him to do. Surely with just great agony. And he lifts the knife up over his son Isaac and he's ready to bear down. And God stops him and provides a, a different sacrifice in the, in the thicket. A ram caught in the thicket by its horns. God provided a sacrifice for Abraham. And we look at Abraham's faith and we say, wow. Look at the evidence of God's powerful presence and his mercy and his grace, his sustaining power. Look at Rahab, a prostitute in the pagan city of Jericho. She knows nothing of God or his ways, but she knows that it is right to harbor those Israelite spies and to give them, give them safety and security in the city, even though it would cost her her life if she was caught. Look at her faith and you say, if a prostitute in a pagan nation who knew nothing about God and his ways can be connected to the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ and have eternal life because of that faith, I can too. You see what I'm saying? This cloud of witnesses, but not a bunch of people standing around. It's their stories, their testimonies of faith that chapter 11 just talked about, that witnesses, that bears testimony to you and I that we can run the life of faith as well. And that's why it says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with endurance the race set out for us. Isn't that awesome? So the Bible talks about two deaths and two resurrections. When we sinned as human beings, two deaths came into the picture. Now the first one I think we're painfully aware of. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. We, this is a death that we all experience. It's the death in this life. We get that. That's the first death. What is the second death? Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Get this. The one who can destroy the soul in hell. This is the second death. Now everybody reads John 3.16. Everybody knows this verse. Probably all of us could recite it from memory. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, now this, this kind of has confounded me because we so misunderstand this when God puts these two things against each other. They shall not perish, but rather have eternal life. Meaning perishing is the opposite of being alive. It's, it's really so simple. And God gives us this as an illustration. And he gives it to us in a few other places. But I want to look at this word perish. What does that mean? What is the second death? Job chapter 20, starting in verse 6. Though the pride of the godless person reaches to the heavens and his head touches the clouds, he will perish forever like his own dung. Kind of vivid imagery there. It's a good uh, dinner conversation. Psalm chapter 37. But the wicked will perish. Though the Lord's enemies are like the flowers of the field, they will be consumed. They will go up in smoke. 
Ezekiel chapter 28, all right, the context here, this is talking about Satan, Lucifer, the accuser, the serpent from the garden. And it says, you were in the garden of God. You were a guardian cherub, a mighty warrior angel protecting the presence of the Most High. You were adorned with every precious stone and you were blameless in all your ways until the day that evil was found in you. And it talks about how Lucifer fell into, into sin and became the one who, who propagates sin in this world and accuses God's people. And it's talking about his end. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You've come to a horrible end and will be no more. Look at what the NLT says here. You've come to a terrible end and you will exist no more. Now, if you're burning forever in hell, that is an existence. That's why it's called burning forever in hell, because you're there. That's what you're doing. This is, this is not the end. The, the fire of hell is used to extract restitution. We're going to get into all of that, the judgment process in our study on judgment. I don't want to get off in the weeds, but you have to understand here that the end, the result, the second death is death. It's death, the opposite of life. We can't miss that. Malachi chapter 4. Surely the day is coming, it, it, meaning hell, will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming, and the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Next verse. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. And verse 3. Then you will trample on the wicked, they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. Anybody ever burned something up before? It's been a, it was a long uh, winter there and we burned a bunch of fires in the fireplace. And, and when you burn a fire, does it just burn continuously forever and ever? Or is it that when the fuel runs out, the fire stops? And what is left once the wood, maybe for your fireplace, is all burned up? Ashes. I had to shovel out a big old pile of ashes at our old house in the fireplace because the next, the next winter was coming and I went to go burn the first fire and it's like this pile of ashes in there and I got to shovel it out. That's what this verse is talking about. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord God Almighty. Hebrews chapter 10. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. This is a sobering passage uh, and it would be great to get into it but for the purposes of our study here let's keep reading only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God what does that look like a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God second Peter 2 6 if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly now I ask again, are Sodom and Gomorrah still burning to this day? Then to me, that says that what is going to happen to the ungodly is whatever happened to Sodom and Gomorrah seems pretty clear. They were burned up, reduced to ashes, and like Malachi says, they are gone forever. All right, so this, this series of, uh, of verses kind of led me into a, uh, a series of questions, all right? And, and I grew up believing that the soul is eternal. And that when you die, you stand before God, you go to one of two places, you live forever. And I believed that the penalty for sin, meaning death, is burning forever in hell. And, and because of that, I had a series of questions kind of pop up. And, and I call this the, the accounting question. Because our salvation is a matter of accounting. Whatever we owe for our sin had to be paid for us to be able to live forever and to escape the wages of sin. So let's look at what are the wages of sin. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. This is just like John 3.16, right? So that they should not perish but have eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. It's a gift because we don't have it in and of ourselves. We need God to give it to us. We need to have the right to eat from the tree of life in order to live forever. But the question is, what, what are the wages of sin? So I wanted to take this question real quick before we move on. If the wages of sin is death, 
then doesn't our death pay for our sins? Why can't everyone go to heaven? All right, this is a great question. If the wages of sin is death, then how come we all don't pay for our own sin when we die? It's a good question because it points out the fact that we need to operationalize or define the, the definition of what does this word mean, death. Because if that death is the death of the body, then everyone from Mother Teresa to Hitler pays what they owe when they die. And so everyone can go to heaven. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not really in line with the biblical narrative um, because the Bible talks about the righteous and the wicked going to two different places, right? Two different resurrections. And we'll get more to that next week. But it's a great question because it forces us to, to operationalize this word. What does death mean? So let's actually take uh, one more question before we move on. If the price for sin is burning in hell forever, then how did Jesus pay for that? This is the question that I wrestled with and that, and that forced me to readdress some of my presuppositions. If the price for sin is burning forever and ever in hell, if that is what we have to do because of sin, then that's what Jesus would have to do in order to cover us. If I owed you a thousand dollars and I came up to you and I said, here you go, one dollar, I mean I know it's not the same thing, but it's like, you know, it's, it's something, it's one. Would, would the accounting be balanced? Would my debt be paid? Is God one of these uh, one of these manipulative and wicked accountants like from the Old Testament where they said they used imbalanced scales to cheat people? Is that God? Is he, is he going to, to take more than what is owed or take less than what is owed? No. For the gift of salvation to be legitimate, we have to have a payment for the wages of sin. And the wages of sin is death. And if that death is burning forever and ever and ever for billions and billions and trillions and trillions of years, if that is what happens to sinners because of sin, then Jesus would have to pay that to the T in order for the righteous to be exempt from the payment. And this plagued me. I'm like, this doesn't make sense. It, it's the core of our salvation. It's the core of everything that we believe, that, of what the Bible is about. Jesus paying the wages for his people so that we can live forever with him. Now, how did Jesus burn forever and ever in hell? Is he still there to this day? Will he be there forever? And then obviously when you read the Bible, you see that, that Jesus was dead and in the ground for three days. And he rose to life on the third day. So surely he's not in hell forever. So what does this mean for us? Well, the reality is that the death that the Bible speaks of, the wages of sin is death, is the death of the soul, which is defined as being once alive, but no longer alive. You were alive, but now you're not. You cease to exist in a state of lifelessness, unconsciousness. If that is the price for sin, as we read in Scripture, then Jesus did, in fact, pay the wages of sin. The, the balance of the accounting ledger, is it's, it's fair, it's just, it's complete, and you and I have hope for eternity, forever and ever. And that is the point of this study on death. We have a lot of questions uh, floating around and circling, uh, swirling about what happens when we die. The reality is that the death in this life is a curse, is a, is a consequence of the fact that sin has entered this planet and has corrupted everything. Our lives, our bodies, they decay. But the second death is the one that we need to be afraid of, that we need to be weary of, the one where our soul will be destroyed forever. We lose the right to live forever. But praise God for the blood of Jesus that covers over a multitude of sins. And by faith, like Hebrews chapter 11 said, we can be counted among the righteous, covered by Jesus' blood, by faith and experience the resurrection to life eternal, a free gift because Jesus laid down his right to live so that we can take it up. What a God we serve. So we touched on the two deaths 
In the next session, we're going to touch on the two resurrections and talk more about that. To continue our series, What Happens When You Die. If you want more information, please visit us online at rrfaithministries.org or you can send us an email, rrfaithministries at gmail.com. Be looking forward to seeing you in the next session. Faith Ministries is a not-for-profit religious education organization and is not affiliated with any denomination or church. Any copyrighted materials used in this video are intended for educational purposes only and are covered under the Fair Use Act.